Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Gospel Record of Luke. The Gospel Record of Luke in chapter number 1. We're beginning this series of the Gospel Record of Luke, which we're going to be in for quite a while. But this is such a wonderful Gospel Record. So many details given to us about the life of Jesus Christ. And as we start here, even the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. We started this morning by speaking a little bit about the introduction as the uh, writer... Dr. Luke had put this together as a research project and he was putting it together to set in order the life and times of Jesus pretty much in chronological order and not taking rumor but trying to make sure that this was written by valid eyewitness accounts and verified. And now as we step into starting at verse number 5 in the gospel record of Luke chapter 1 starting at verse 5, we now start to get more into the history, more of the historical record, and we start to see some things that were laid as a foundation before the birth of Jesus Christ. Notice with me if you don't mind in the gospel record of Luke chapter 1, looking with us starting at verse number 5, the word of God says this, there was in the days of Herod, a king, uh, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abba and, her, Abba, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they both were righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they were both now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before the Lord in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense." And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John." And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor small drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn toward their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well stricken in years. And the angel answered, said, answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and I am sent to speak unto thee, and to show you the, these glad tidings. And behold... Thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zechariah and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days where he looked upon me to take away my reproach among men. 
And if you're in the habit of marking things in the Bible, would you mark a phrase that we find in the gospel record of Luke in chapter 1? The gospel record of Luke chapter number 1 and speaking about the child that they were to have, notice with me in verse number 15 as what the angel is described unto Zechariah, the future father of this child, for he shall be great in the sight of of the Lord. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. And with the Lord's help, we want to hit this very interesting historical account dealing with Zechariah and the proclamation of, of John the Baptist and how God described John the Baptist that he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. Let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come up to you and we just hit this historical passage, I'm asking that this would narrative would come alive. That we could see it in our mind's eye. That we could see the things that transpire. That we could see the importance of this proclamation and what had happened in the interaction between Gabriel and Zechariah. I'm asking that you would just open up our eyes. Give us just a spiritual sight to see this. And that we could see that you are a great and mighty God who is able to do even the impossible and that we would trust and depend upon you for the impossible and we love you in Jesus name we pray amen now as we start we understand that at this time there has been 400 years of silence that God has not spoken to his people he has not revealed any more scripture and the last promise in the book of Malachi was that God was going to send someone in the spirit of of Elijah, someone in the spirit of the power of the preacher that was going to come and prepare the way before Jesus Christ, to prepare the paths, to make his way straight, so that way it would be easier for the people to respond to the Lord. And with this, God has been silent for 400 years, and now after 400 years of silence, he speaks. And he speaks in a, in a way, not pronouncing it before everyone, but having a private conversation with a man just doing his job in the temple. The first thing I'd like to bring to your attention from this narrative is the priest in the temple. The priest in the temple. The Bible starts off by introducing to us to a couple. Notice with me in verse number 5. There was in the days of Herod, king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So we're introduced, first of all, to this couple here, and we could see that they are actually from the Levites, the priestly tribe, and getting some of their heritage. Notice we learn a little bit more about them. Verse 6. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinance of the Lord, blameless. So we hear the character of these two people. That these two people, they followed after the Levitical line. They were the priestly line. And they had lived their life trying to be obedient to God the best they could. Obeying the Bible. They were blameless. That carries the idea that nobody could grab a hold and accuse them of anything. That they had lived their lives for a long time following after God. They were considered righteous people. They were considered holy people. They were considered people who had a walk with God. Notice as it goes on some more, we learn a little bit more about them in verse number 7. They had no child. Why? Because, bar because Elizabeth was barren and they both now were well stricken in years. Now this couple had been praying for a child for many years and they haven't been able to produce a child and now they're well stricken in years. Now this statement is very important because the Jewish people they had certain ways to try to describe how old someone was. That even in the... <coughs> Among the Jewish people, old age begins at 65. That's pretty good. Most of you are safe now. Old age doesn't begin until you're 65. At 70, you are considered to be uh, called a hoary head. You were hoary headed age. That was kind of describing the silver hair and that was a little bit more uh, frizzled. And then at 80, you would be considered well stricken in years. And so as we look at this couple, and the Bible describes them, they had been praying for a child all their life. They have kind of given up hope, but it was something they had kind of prayed for. 
But now they're 80 years old. They're well stricken in years and they still don't have a child. Again, God is setting this up and letting us know where they're at. So if you can imagine an 80 year old man, an 80 year old woman, they had lived their life trying to serve God. They lived their life hoping for a child and never having one, but they walked with God nonetheless. They tried to do what's right. They had a reputation. They had a testimony among the people. And now we find the duties that they have, verse number eight. Eight, And it came to pass that while he, Zecharias, executed the priest office, office before God in the order of his course. Now, because there were so many priests now that had come from the Levitical line, remember that 1,400 years have passed since Moses in the wilderness. There's probably a lot of people from the tribe of Levi at this time. And even more from the direct tribe of of Aaron who was supposed to take care of the things in the house. And because they had so many people, what they did is that the Levites had took turns to take care of the things of the house of God. So someone might have a house somewhere in Judea outside of the city in their own place. And when it came time, they would have a scheduled time where they had the privilege of working the temple. And when they worked in the temple, their their jobs were divided even further because there was so many people to take care of things, they could spread the work out. In fact, notice with me if you don't mind in verse 9. According to the custom of the priest office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Now, as we've described before in the tabernacle, the temple, that the temple inside of the temple, the holies, had several pieces of furniture. On one side, you would have the table of showbread. And every day, the priest would have to make brand new bread in a certain fashion. Then they would have someone take out the old bread. They would have someone else take the new bread. Then over here, you had the altar of incense. And the altar of incense, it was a big candlestick that ran off of oil. And they had to make sure that that the... Um, the tap of uh, the oils, the lamp was lit with a certain sensor. They had to have a certain type of sensor, a certain recipe of of things that uh, of oils that. Uh, that they lit the fire to. And then they had to make sure the oil was refilled. And so they had a couple priests who had certain jobs. Then you had in the very back, you had the altar of incense. And the altar of incense, you would have a little place where they would burn the incense and have that sweet savor going up. Now, in order to do their job, some of these priests would be in there to, uh, excuse me, to go and remain the previous day's offerings of incense. So you would have someone who would have to clean out the ashes. That makes sense. You don't want the ashes to build up. Then someone else would go and kind of strike the fire and uh, cover the grid with live coals that was from the brazen altar outside. They would bring it in and put it in. And then you would have another person who would actually put the brand new incense on. That makes sense. And they would do it in a matter of course. Now, when they did it in a matter of course, you would have... um, the people who did the table of showbread and they would do it by themselves. You didn't want the whole thing crowded. You'd have the people who did the, uh, the, <clears throat> the golden candlestick and they would do that by course. And then you would have the person who would do the altar of incense and they would do it matter of course. So the first guy would come and he would clean out the ashes and clean out the leftovers and then he would leave. That would leave two. Then the person would go and he would uh, put the grid on the um, the grill cover and he would put the live coals from the altar of a brazen altar outside. He would put it on and he would leave. And that would leave just Zacharias whose turn it was. And he would do it in a certain way to go ahead and put uh, some of the um, incense on. And when he put the things of the incense on outside, the people were outside praying. And they were supposed to pray. And what would happen is that uh, as the people priests were doing their duties, there would be people who would be praying and praising the Lord. And then they would have certain songs they would sing. And there was a great ceremony that would go along with it. So here's Zechariah. He's all by himself. He goes forward to the place of incense and begins to start working on it. The people are waiting outside. They're waiting to see what's going to happen. <coughs> Excuse me. Good. And... Um, As Zechariah is working, he turns around and notice what happens, if you don't mind, as we pick it back up. Verse 10. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without 
at the time of incense. So the people outside, they're praying, they're waiting for Zechariah. Zechariah is all by himself. And verse 11, and there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. So here's Zechariah. The first guy leaves. The second guy leaves. He's all by himself. And so he starts to do his job and starts going. And he just feels a presence. The hairs on the back of his head start, or back of the neck start standing. And he looks up and there's an angel standing there. What would you do? I mean, the only entrance is behind you. And you look up and there's a guy standing there. Ooh, that would just frighten you, especially since it's not definitely not a priest. And he's startled. Have you ever been startled when you're by yourself in an empty place and you look and there's someone there and just, just scares you to death? And he looks up and there's an angel there standing on the right side of the altar. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. Wouldn't you be afraid too? You look up and not only do you look up, it's an angel standing there and I mean, what do you do? What do you say? What do you respond? And he's just, he's an old man. He's 80 years old. And so he's not just a young man. He's an 80 year old guy. Looks up, scared to death. He probably has that heart just beating a little bit. And notice if you don't mind, we see the prophecy of John. So we move from the priest in the temple to the prophecy of John. And notice what the very first thing the angel says to him. And the angel said unto him, fear not Zechariah. <laughs> hey, Zechariah, I'm here for a reason. Why are you here? Zechariah, fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard. Zechariah, I'm here to tell you God answered your prayer. I don't know if that would do much for his fear. His heart's like, still, what prayer? <laughs> what, what are you talking about? I'm all by myself. What's going on? He said, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. And thou shalt call his name John. Zacharias, I'm here to tell you some good news. You wait until I'm by myself? Good news? Great, I'm going to have a son. I mean, Zacharias is just looking at him like frozen as this angel tells him, good news! Don't fear, I'm telling you some good news. Verse number 14, notice as he starts to talk about John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Why? Because with God, nothing is impossible. God's going to answer a prayer. Here's an 80-year-old couple, and they're going to have a baby, and people have been knowing they've been praying. People have been going up to them for years. Do you have any prayer requests? Yes, we want a child. We don't know how, we just want a child. And now... Their prayers are answered. They're going to have a child and many people are going to rejoice. And many people are going to say only God could have done that. After all, an 80-year-old lady having a baby, only God could have done that. And people are going to rejoice. They're going to be excited. This is a great birth. This is going to be a great proclamation. Let's describe more about John, verse 15. For he, this is the babe, shall be great in the sight of the Lord. Now let me pause here. Inside of the Bible, the word great is not tossed around at all. Not at all. It's used very few times. And in fact, in the Bible, there's only a handful of people that God calls great. Now, in our vocabulary, we use great all the time. It was a great snowstorm. We had a great rain the other day. That was a great game. We, we use that word so much that it's lost its meaning. But inside of the Bible, this word is used very rarely. It speaks about Abraham, that he was great. It speaks about David, that David was great. If I remember off the top of my head, there was two other people that God called great. And number five is John the Baptist. John the Baptist, in God's sight, not man's sight, in God's sight, God calls him great. This is a big deal for John to be born. That John's responsibility. He is going to be considered great. Not in an in a overused type way. But in a way that emphasizes this is important. For he shall be great in the sight of God. Now again, whose perspective is John being called great? 
in God's perspective. God is going to call him great. And John, he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink because he's going to be separated to God. He's going to be part of taking the vow of a Nazarite. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. God is saying this young man, this baby that's going to be born is going to be separated unto me and going to be used as my instrument even from the time he is born. From the time he's conceived. That God has a plan for this young child. And he's going to be separated. And he's going to have a purpose. What is the purpose? Verse 16. And many of the children of Israel shall he, John, turn to the Lord their God. Remember that many of the Hebrew people have kind of turned away from God. God's more of a poster. More of a a theme, more of an idea that sure we serve Jehovah, we're part of God's people, but most people didn't take God in their thoughts on a daily basis. Sure they went to temple and they did the ceremonies, but God was not a big thing. They didn't have a personal relationship. God was a construct. He was an idea. He was an abstract, not something that was real. And it was because of John the, or it's going to be cut going to become because of John the Baptist that many, that's not a few, many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord thy God. Many people are going to trust God and believe in God's promises because of the ministry of John. This is a big deal because we're going to see even as Jesus worked with the Israelite people that many of the Israelite people were resisted. But here's John the Baptist that is going to have a great ministry among the Jewish people. Notice as it goes on in verse 17. And he, John the Baptist, shall go before him. Now notice this. Who's this him that's referred to? This passage in verse number 17 is actually referring to a promise in in, uh, the book of Malachi. In the book of Malachi, it gives the promise that the Messiah is coming. And the Messiah is coming, but before the Messiah comes, God is going to send a messenger. He's going to send a herald. He's going to send someone that is going to prepare the people to listen to their God. How does this work? So imagine if you don't mind in the ancient world, a king is approaching the village. Now, because they want the people to pay attention to the king, they would send a herald into the village to say, listen, your king is coming. He is behind me. I want you to be ready. I want you to go take a bath. I want you to put on your nice clothes. I want you to be presentable. I want you to be prepared to face your king. All right, everyone get ready. Go now. And the herald will go off and get people. So by the time the king comes, the people are already prepared. They have done whatever they need to, to be able to face their king. That's what John the Baptist was meant to do. That Jesus is right behind him. Jesus is actually a couple months behind him. And his job is to prepare the way, to make the people prepared to face Jesus Christ, the King. So when Jesus Christ comes on the scene, the people say, there he is. And John says, I've been telling you, you're ready to follow him. Because without John the Baptist, without that preparation, the people would be more resistant to Jesus. But now there are going to be more people who'd be willing to know Jesus Christ and follow him and become their disciples because of what John was to do. This is a big deal. Notice again verse 17. And he, John, shall go before him, Christ, in the spirit and power of Elias. Now this Elias is a New Testament spelling of the Old Testament Elijah. Remember, Elijah was a great preacher. In fact, he was a great preacher of miracles. When Elijah stood up, people listened. Whether it was, God is not going to let it rain until my word. See you later. And he takes off for three and a half years. And people were looking for Elijah. I mean, they had him on milk cartons. Have you seen this man? And they were all looking for Elijah because Elijah was the one who was going to pray and bring down the rain. Even the heathen were looking for Elijah. When Elijah spoke, the people listened. When Elijah told King Ahab, hey, you gather everyone and you go to Mount Carmel and we're going to see who God's real. Ahab obeyed. He didn't arrest Elijah on the spot. He gathered all of Israel and put them out there to be an audience. When Elijah spoke, the people listened. And here God says that John the Baptist is going to come 
into the spirit and power of Elijah. That when he spoke, the people were going to listen and pay attention. This is the messenger of God and everyone is going to recognize it. Notice as it goes on, he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Notice this. Notice the things that John was going to do. He was going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. You know, in this day here, fathers got to the place where they neglected their kids. They had the idea where, you know what? They could stay at home, let mom raise them. I'm going to go ahead and work. And they ignored their kids. It's almost like today. Do you know that the average father today in America, if he's in the home, only spends five minutes of face-to-face time with his children? Five minutes. Is that enough to influence a child? Is that enough to direct their path? Five minutes. That's average. That's not doing well. And at this day, it was the same time. The fathers didn't have the heart towards the children. Their hearts were somewhere else. Notice what else? That he was going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. That he was going to preach. And many people who are disobedient to the Lord would turn and change their path. And start walking the way that they ought to. Because of the preaching of John the Baptist. And... To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. To make them ready to go. Now this is a great proclamation. Now again, what's the scenario? Zacharias is in the temple. The first guy leaves. The second guy leaves. He's all by himself. He doesn't suspect anything. He's just doing his job. And so he goes and starts preparing uh, the incense and putting it on. Feels something. Looks up. And hears an angel. And he starts... He still hasn't said anything. And the angel says, fear not. I'm here to answer your prayer. You're going to have a child. And let me tell you about this child. This child is going to prepare the way. He's going to make the way straight. He's going to be great before the sight of the Lord. Hey, isn't this great? And he makes this proclamation. Notice if you don't mind, there's something else I want to point to you. The price for unbelief. So here's the angel. Gives a proclamation to Zacharias. Zacharias is listening to this angel speak. And the first thing that Zacharias responds to is the only thing he heard. I'm going to have a child? He, He missed all the rest of it because he's stuck on the one thing, the impossible thing. Verse number 18. And Zacharias said unto him, the angel, whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is well stricken in years. So he missed all of the John the Baptist part and what he's going to do. He's like, I'm going to have a kid? Uh, That's How can I have a kid? I'm 80. My wife is 80. Uh, Now it's the angel's time to to be surprised. It's not often that an angel can get surprised. But here, he makes this declaration. He announces what happens. And now this puny human just goes, how do you know this is going to happen? I just told you. Notice in verse 19. And the angel said unto him, I am Gabriel. May we pause here? There are only three named angels in the Bible. There, of course, is Lucifer who fell from heaven and we know is Satan. The other named angel is named Michael. And Michael's job is the guardian angel of Israel. His his job is to guard Israel from the things that are going on. You see him in uh, Daniel quite a bit speaking with Daniel. The other named angel is the highest. There's only one archangel. One. That's it. There's not multiple archangels. There's one. And that's him. Gabriel. And Gabriel's used to giving orders to other angels. Hey, you go do this. And they don't argue and they don't fight. They don't go, well, what about... They just do what they're told. Gabriel's not used to giving a command and giving a proclamation and somebody questioning him. This is a first. He surprised him. What do you mean? 
I just told you good news. And I meant, why didn't you believe what I told you? I'm an angel. What's the problem here? Well, that's the difference between angels and humans, right? Humans were very doubtous and this is unbelievable and trying to wrap our mind around it. Angels are used to being told what to do and obeying and telling people what to do and then being obeyed immediately. So the angel surprised it. Verse 19, and the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel. That was pretty much all the answer. What do you mean? How do I know this is going to happen? I'm Gabriel. That's me enough. I'm Gabriel. I'm the archangel. What do you mean? I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. I'm Gabriel the archangel. I stand in the presence. I answer to God. I came. God told me to come down, tell you this, and... You're questioning? I'm Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and I am sent to speak to thee and to show you these glad tidings. I thought this would be good news. I was expecting to say, hey, you're going to have a baby. God answer your prayer and God's going to use the baby. You're not going to go, yay, God answered my prayer. But instead I get, um, how do I know this is going to happen? Wasn't the expected response Gabriel was looking for. He was saying, thank you God, fall down to my knees. What a great God that we have. Praise the Lord, he answers prayer. But I get, um, the, the angel surprised. Pretty good. It's very hard to surprise an angel. And he successfully did it. <laughs> okay. Verse 20. And behold... Thou shall be dumb. That means he's not going to be able to speak. You want a sign? You want proof? Fine. You can't speak. And thou shall be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed. Because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. I mean, by the way, if you didn't realize, archangels have lots of power. He was sent to go say, tell you some good news. God's going to answer your prayer. And back I got, how is this going to happen? I'm Gabriel. Fine. If you don't believe me, you can't speak until this is done. How about that? Now will you believe me? I mean, go ahead and ask the stupid question again. Let's see how that turns out for you. Now, by the way, may I pause? His wife is somewhere else. They're not together. He's on a business trip to work for a certain amount of time his wife is not currently expecting. I'm giving you a time frame. He's got to go home when he's done with his work, however many months it's left, then go back to his wife and somehow communicate with her when he can't speak. And then she's got to conceive the child. Then they've got to wait the nine months. So let me tell you that this is not a nine month. This is over nine months that he's not going to be able to speak. And he's got to communicate with his wife. Hey, I had an angel come and tell me and talk to me about this stuff. And I, this, is, this is a big, I don't want to say a harsh punishment, but you think he learned his lesson that, you know, when the angel tells you what to do that, you know, I don't question it. Yes, sir. <laughs> and so notice what happened. In verse 20, and thou shalt, not be able to, uh, thou shall be dumb and not be able to speak until the day that these things should be formed, because thou believest not my word, which shall be fulfilled in their season. This is going to happen. And because you didn't believe me, you're not going to be able to be quiet. Then the angel took off. We just assume he took off. Now, outside in the temple, verse 21, and the people waited for Zechariah and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. So remember that outside they're doing their own ceremony. They're praying and they're waiting for the, the person to come out. And when the person would come out, he would usually uh, say, all right, now let's give a blessing. And they would give a prayer. They would read a psalm. There would be a certain psalm that would be, or sub, certain several psalms that would have to be read right after this. And then he would give like a little benediction, a little prayer. And then the people would be dismissed. And the next part of the temple ceremony would go on. So the people have been outside and they were like, how long does this take? Especially for the people who didn't want to pray, but they were tasked to pray. Can you imagine there's probably somewhere out there? It's taking this guy so long. 
And he's in there. What's going on? It didn't take that long to put incense on the thing. Where's he at? What's going on? And they're marveling. and They're waiting what's going on. Just hurry up. I want to go to my next part of the day. <laughs> Verse number 22. And when he, Zecharias, came out, he could not speak to them. Which is going to be a problem because... He was supposed to speak. He was supposed to give a message. He was supposed to read the Bible, pray, and he goes out and... And they're like, we don't understand sign language. What's the matter with you? Throat lozenge? Hot tea? What, what does this mean? And he's out there trying to explain what happened. Verse um, 22, and when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. Now notice, they perceived that he had a vision. He saw something. He couldn't say, hey, I saw angel, a Gabriel and the archangel and we had a conversation. Or he spoke to me and I got in trouble. And, but they said, he must have something happened in there. We don't know what, but something happened in there. So we're just going to assume that it was of God. I don't know what it is. He had some type of vision. And for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. So he's out there. He can't speak. He's out there trying to give sign language. And they're like, categories, Pictionary. What does that mean? Uh, four words. Rhymes. They're trying to figure out. He's trying to communicate. Trying to get something across. Can't speak. Can you imagine how hard it would be to suddenly not be able to speak? Not be able to communicate. Not be able to tell people what you did. And kind of be stuck that way. And he's trying to explain. And they're all looking at him ready to speak. All right. Well, that's cool. When are you going to give us the psalm? What do we do? What do we do now? He can't speak. I meant we're supposed to go on with a ceremony. The swear, you know, remember ceremonies are very big for the Jewish people, especially at this time. Temple worship had to be certain thing. And if that didn't happen, then, you know, the whole thing's going to fall apart and the world's going to cave in. They're just... What do we do now? Does someone get up there? Does someone tag in? Do, you know, what do we do? Well, verse 23, And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, remember he was put in Jerusalem for a certain number of time, he had to finish out his term. Well, you can't speak. I guess we're going to have you do something else, so you go ahead and do this, but you can't go home. You got to finish out your term, your, your task for this mission. And when these things were accomplished, he departed to his own house. All right, now he's got to go home and explain to Elizabeth in sign language and writing or trying to do something. Good. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days where he looked upon me to take away my approach from men. Now notice that word hid. This word hid um, doesn't mean that she's hiding from the public. It carries the idea that she's just stayed indoors. After all, an 80-year-old lady carrying the extra weight of a baby, that's going to take it out of her. She's staying in the house not moving. Can you imagine how fragile an 80-year-old lady would be trying to carry a baby? Man, my stomach's so big I can mimic it pretty good. You know, I mean, you watch expectantly. Yeah, ladies, remember it when you had babies and you had to get up from the couch and it was kind of just, you know. Imagine you're 80. No wonder she hid herself in the house. That was like bed rest. And her husband's trying to take care of her. And the neighbors are all curious. And wow, Elizabeth, that, I've never expected this to happen. You know, and they're trying to take care of her. And she's just, she's trying to take care of herself. It is going to take a lot of energy. Now, think about this. Once the baby's born, someone's got to chase down the little rascal. Imagine 80 years old trying to chase down a toddler. Two-year-old. I mean, there, she, she needs a rest now because her life's going to be turned upside down even more. And so they wait. And we're going to find out on Wednesday what happens more. What happens with this story? What occurs? But for now, I want to encourage you that God is a God of the impossible. That with God... All things are possible. Are you still praying for impossible prayers? Are you still praying for things that there's no way this can happen? There's n 
But I'm going to pray for it anyways. I encourage you to continue to pray for the impossible things. Maybe it's been a while. Maybe you had that impossible prayer, but you haven't dusted it off in a while. You kind of just let it sit in the shelf. May I tell you that there's a God who's still listening to your prayers. He's recording them. And there's a God who wants to answer and give good gifts to his children. Just keep praying the impossible. Keep praying and let a God who could do anything answer those prayers. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.